So, uh, I don't have a presentation. Uh, there's nothing in particular I talk about. It's what you all want to talk about. So, I'm here for, for as little as 15 minutes or as much as two plus hours. If you have questions, comments, concerns, I can take notes. If you want me to look into something, I'll get back to you. If you just have questions about things going on in the county, either things that have just happened or things that we can foreseeably assume is going to happen, I'm happy to discuss those. I try to be as upfront and honest and give you as much information as I have on uh, pretty much anything. So with that, I'll just open it up. Yes, ma'am. Can we start with Emerson sure. Reserve? With, uh, I'll start to the extent I can on Emerson. I assumed you were going to ask that. Get it out of the way. <laughs> no, you said you were going to ask I it. know. Um, I've just been figuring out how much I want to say, just relative to the fact it's in negotiation, so I don't want to burn us. Emerson Point is something we talked about yesterday to the extent people were watching yesterday's meeting. A couple years ago, we passed an environmental land tax. 71% of the voters approved it, which adds a millage of 0.15 to all of your real estate taxes. Uh, the intent was to get us approximately $50 million worth of acquisition capacity to buy environmentally sensitive lands around Manatee County for the next few years. We have an LMAC board that reviews opportunities and then brings them to the board to determine whether or not we want to move forward with it with your tax dollars. One of the properties that we're actively looking at is on Sneed Island. Uh, Emerson Point is an insanely nice Preserve. It's certainly the nicest preserve north of the river. I mean, everyone always talks about Robinson Preserve and Perico next to it. People don't talk about Emerson as much. It's a little bit smaller, a little more out of the way, which is unfortunate. I absolutely love Emerson. We have an opportunity to acquire over 90 acres immediately adjacent to it on the water in uh, on Sneed Island. It would allow us to expand Emerson Point. It would eventually get fold it into and, and meaningfully increase the size and, and utilization of that preserve. Right now, where we stand is we directed LMAC as a board 7-0 to do the diligence on it and have our staff start the negotiations on it. The details always matter. I mean, people want us to always want to say, just buy it. Well, that's great, but it's not my money. It's your money. And there's a, a reasonableness of price. Someone can't just come in and say, I want $100 million and expect me to come up with $100 million. If, if, if we tell potential sellers that money's no object because we're going to get yelled at for not buying something, then the price goes up. We have a, a limited capacity of funds. So where we stand with Emerson is it's been in negotiations. We've gotten appraisals done. We've done all of our diligence on it. And there's a gap between what we believe we have the capacity to pay and what the seller wants. That's gonna be a case on a property like this because it's a property that's zoned for residential. Right now it's it's a future land use R1, effectively as of right. So it's 97 acres. You could basically put 97 single family homes on there on Sneed Island on the water. There's, there's a value to that. And with all the good intentions of a seller who wanna keep it conservative, Good intentions still have a price tag on them <laughs> at some point in time. So it, so it may be, be willing to take a discount, but there's a difference between a discount and just giving something away. So it will be homes. It won't be like a conservation. I can't say what, it, no, no. If we buy it, it's 100% conservation. We're not buying it to build on it. We, we're buying it to turn it into an extend, extension of Emerson. Okay, that's yeah. If we do not buy it, their alternative is to sell it to a developer. And because of that, they've got a price tag in their head based upon what would a developer be willing to pay for this? And how does that deviate from what we're able to pay for it? So that's, that's the gap we're trying to fill. The problem is we've been trying to fill this gap for a month and a half now, two months now. That's why yesterday I made the motion to direct staff, sit down with them and their attorney in the next two weeks and come to a final price. I don't care what that price is. I don't care if it's 10 million, 12 million, 15 million, whatever it is, and bring it back to us because nothing's going to change. And as with a lot of stuff we do, if we don't put a firm deadline on it, we're going to be having this conversation in May. And then we're going to have this conversation in July and August when we come back from recess. And then finally, the seller is just going to give up and go sell it to someone else. So I said, come back with the best price. And then we as a board can vote up or down, yes or no, are we comfortable with that price? There's a few additional dynamics to this one. 
because it is on the target list for the state of Florida. So there is the potential, but not the guarantee, that the state of Florida would contribute to this purchase. Uh, what they're willing to contribute is up in the air because they're prohibited from paying more than appraised value. Like they can't, like by rule they cannot. What their appraisal is is lower than what our appraisal is. And that doesn't factor in the fact that the seller wants to keep essentially a portion of the waterfront to build like four estates for their family on it, which that land was factored into the original appraised value. So there, there are some dynamics to this, but my intention is still to acquire that. I said from day one, when it first got presented to us, I said that was my absolute favorite piece. Of all the stuff, we looked at Crooked River up by Old Tampa. <coughs> you go. Uh, we looked at the, place, the, the parcel by Twin Rivers, which we're still looking at. That's in negotiation right now. Um, we looked at a, a number of parts. I said from day one, this is my favorite piece. Though. Well, because you'd like it, they're all going to vote no. So. <laughs> I'm sorry, I said that out loud. I hate, I hate that piece. I really hope the rest of the board doesn't vote in favor of this. <laughs> no, that would be nice. Right now the gap is, depending on how you, because I don't know what their, their revised number is. Just on. what is an estimate? I'm say five, between three and five um, is the cap. But that said, it's 97 acres. So when you look at that gap on a per acre basis, it's not that dramatic. I mean, I now, if we try to widen our no, roads, we get- say, Three to five million is not that. I thought it was like, you know, 20 million well, don't forget. Right we, don't forget. This fund was only a fifty million dollar fund. I Five million dollars is ten percent of the I entirety of that fund. Yeah, <laughs> it's not, it's, it's, it's three to five million is not big when you're talking about building like a park for veterans. But <laughs> yeah. it's but when you're talking take that money and use it for five million dollars on a fifty million dollar fund, that's not insignificant. Sure. Uh, we have the same thing with Nixon. Mixon's was the same, a similar situation where the difference between the value of it and what we could conceivably pay, there was more dynamics to that one. But um, we can't buy everything. We're, we're doing our best to find opportunities and then we do our best to use taxpayer dollars in the smartest way we can to maximize them across the most land with the most environmental benefit. Sometimes we do, like Crooked River, sometimes we don't. I'm hopeful we do here, because I love Emerson. And I'd love to see that expand and get more people up here um, taking advantage of North of the River a little bit more. And they could call me for charters. Now you gotta think, I've got some basil off your porch. I can you some basil. <laughs> did I answer your question about that? Yes. Okay. Did. And, we, and I did make the motion to bring it back next regular meeting, so that's in two weeks, March 12th, um, presumably if they listen to me. Um, it'll get brought back with presuming a final price between the seller and their attorney and the county and our attorney. They'll come to terms and come back and present to us, this is the best and final offer, and then we as a board can decide yes or no. At that point, we can. The state won't guarantee funding until after we acquire it. It's a real pain in the ass. Right. It would be really nice if they would have committed to something. They won't. Um, they've given us kind of a nod of, yay, you know, we're kind of in this eight to 10. Well, I can understand range, that because previous boards and well, now you got the Satanic Six that's here, but previous boards have literally thrown money away after the state that it was supposed to go for this, that, and the other thing. Uh -huh. There was a whole lot of, I'm talking a few years, but a lot of that stuff going on. So I yeah. understand that. It's not sense. always like we were, we knew what was going on with Rattlesnake before we acquired Rattlesnake Key. Like we certainly didn't have. 30 plus million dollars laying around, but we knew this state had 29 million coming in. This case, we don't have a guarantee. So that would probably make it a little bit more palatable if we knew there was, sake of argument round number, say it was $10 million from the state. And I don't know what the final number is because I don't know what the revised appraisal is. Say it's 10 million bucks. Well, if I do that, now my gap is, you know, a lot smaller because now my max dollars, call it 5 million, makes it a little bit easier to swallow but mm -hmm. right now we're still risking i've been trying to come up crazy i worked with property management to potentially come up with an, like an escrow agreement that would basically put their deed in escrow put our funds in escrow and then give us a window of time between like 90 180 days to finalize with the state to release escrow maybe they're working on that i kind of laid out for them how that would work um they sounded interesting to them but i don't know
Makes sense. Can I ask your question? <laughs> what? Anyone else have any other questions? Yes, sir. Um, one of your two employees that you have is leaving. Right. And I have maybe I missed it, but I haven't seen anything or heard anything or I mean about who's gonna replace Clay? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um <laughs> we as county commissioners have two employees, as Larry said. Our only employees are the county administrator and the county attorney. Technically we're also the port authority, so in theory Carlos Bacaris, the director of the port's also our employee, but when only when we're wearing a different hat. So we basically have two employees, nobody else. In theory, not always in practice, it seems, uh, we have no say in hiring or firing anybody below those two. So you always see all the news and it's constantly in the news when an administrator leaves every couple of months. <laughs> but with our county attorney, it's been a little quieter, um, which I think is a good thing to some extent. We advertise the position. He's leaving next Friday. 100%. I begged him, can you at least stay until like that following Tuesday? Because we have a meeting the next Tuesday. I'm like, mm -hmm. what are you doing to me? Why don't you wait? It's the end of a pay cycle. He already like, he's literally leaving town the next day to go on like an extended vacation. He's like, I'm done on the 8th. We advertise it. We got 12 applications in. Um, we haven't decided what to do with those applications yet. Um, there are a few people that didn't directly apply that we've in that we've reached out to directly ourselves um, to ask levels of interest. People who have experience in Manatee County, have previously worked in Manatee County, like government. Um, that's the easy way to go. Here, here's the catch with this. An administrator kind of is overseeing directors. Yes, it's helpful to have government experience. Not critical, but, but the attorney is way different. The attorney not only has to have law experience, but has to have government law experience in the state of Florida because of state statute. And really, every county is so unique, you really almost need to have at least a pretty good handle of Manatee County's up to. You can't have, we have applications from kids that just graduated. Mm -hmm. Like, I can't have some kid mm -hmm. skipping in here thinking I'm going to be the county minister. And the first thing I say is, hey, take care of these three sunshine violations. We're figuring out what to do with a Confederate monument. And you know we're getting sued by fourteen people. Well, to add, They're going to quit. To add what you're saying, you know, to appreciate like Bill and 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 even Bill mentioned at one of the commission meetings when there were some questions about LDC. Uh -huh. I mean, he he was kind of the SME and and was a part of crafting some of that language. So you need somebody that is that deeply involved, not yeah. just an attorney that's coming out of those people school. Are, those people are so starting to retire. Who's leaving the attorney or the administrator? Bill Clay, no. Bill, 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 Bill Clay, Clay, the attorney. The attorney. The attorney. The attorney. Yeah, he put in his resignation about a month and a half ago, effective March 8th. So he'll be gone after next Friday. There's no more meetings for him. We have a land use meeting, but he doesn't attend land use. Sarah Shank handles the land side of it. So yeah, it's hard though, because again, those are so far ago. I mean, most of those people are retired. Is there a job description for the attorney that indicates those? Oh yeah, we posted it. I don't know. I'm not trying to memorize right. it. But, <laughs> Just curious. <laughs> no, it was posted on FACO, which is kind of mm -hmm. like we have, the Florida Association of Counties, there's a Florida Association of County Attorneys, it was posted there, it was posted mm -hmm. on D, it was posted on a few other places that HR posted. Because I think you hit the nail on the head, it's going to be somebody Are you looking needs, for a job? No, no, no. But I'm saying, it needs to be somebody that has all those little facets that you're pointing out. Correct. Right it's a very small universe, and you're, it's a full-time job. Like, a lot of the municipalities have high-quality attorneys because it's a part-time job. So, like, the... The, the, the Brutusels and the, the Barnabys and all that, but they, they can have their old jobs still. Mm -hmm. Here, it's full time. So you can't just go get somebody, even somebody who's experienced in government, say, hey, come work here. It, it's not financially feasible for them to do so. so. Right. And then you have all the other layers like risk management, reports to the county attorney. There's a lot, yeah. there's a lot to it. Uh, it's, a big, it's a big office. Um, there's a lot going on because you only see the forward facing, he's sitting there answering a few questions, writing a few resolutions, but we're constantly dealing with Bert Harris Act, you know, getting sued by developers if we decline things. We get, he has to deal with all like the slip and fall stuff. He has to deal with the sheriff's office when their cruiser hits some car coming through a, an intersect. He has a lot on his plate. Um, not to mention all the employment law and everything else. It's, you need somebody. Right. There's, there's one or two people that I believe are fully, fully qualified. Anybody in-house? 
Um, there's somebody in house okay. who is positioned to be the interim mm -hmm. while we figure this out. They prefer not to be the permanent just because of family situation presently. Mm -hmm. um, but we're not going to lose the staff. There's people who know enough right. about Manatee County and what to do that he'll leave on the 8th and come the 9th. We're not going to be in a bad position. It's going to go smooth, but it's not a permanent succession plan because the people in that succession plan don't necessarily want it. Right, honestly, thanks. It's being worked on, hopefully sooner rather than later. Um, but like I said, there, there are a couple people that just made sense. Like you can probably, because of the, the uniqueness of the position, you can probably count on one hand the number of people that actually make sense. That doesn't mean there's not more people that are qualified and we would take if we needed to, but it's a very small universe of people that would really help a smooth transition. Do you interview them, George? Yes. Do you make the decision on the hiring? I make one seventh of it. No, I don't mean. I mean the commission will decide. Yes. Yes. Uh, like I said, we only have two employees. Like I, like Charlie, uh, the county administrator, Charlie Bishop. He can go out and hire a director tomorrow. He can go out and hire a deputy tomorrow. He can do whatever he wants, and we have virtually no say in that. We can cut his budget and make sure those FT positions don't exist to stop him from doing it. And I can, in theory, say hey, you're making a lot of terrible hires, so we're going to fire you. But I can't dictate whether or not he can or cannot hire those people, and I don't necessarily interview those people. I can't, by part of statute, have a say in that. Is there a potential that this could go the way of the library board members? No, you, you, we have to have an attorney. Well, I understand that, but how much does ideology of the candidate come into play? A lot, I'm sure. Okay. And what do you, you watch your ratings occasionally, right? Right. All right. <laughs> that's just, I mean, that's just, first off, that, that's just, that, that's not unique. I mean, to, everyone always wants to act like Manatee County is some like outlier of crazy. Uh, granted, we are very crazy. But I mean, when a new president, let's, let's say Trump gets reelected in November, do you think he's going to walk in and be like, well, look at all this institutional knowledge in this cabinet that's already sitting here under by, I'm going to keep them. No, they're all going to be fired. The next day, regardless of institutional knowledge, and he's going to bring like-minded people in to work with him. That's what you see everywhere. You get new school boards coming in. Well, in Sarasota, they walked in like that's it. You're out. And got rid of their their superintendent. I mean, it's it's not uncommon. It's unfortunate, but that's part of politics. Every four years, I could be voted out. I mean, that's just what it is. And it, and I get voted in or voted out in part based on ideology of the people who happen to live in the town. My only concern with asking is that. Library board members, you could do a do without for a duration, but an attorney, we need as soon as possible. Correct. And but look what I mean. I'll use as an example. Look what happened with the every single time we've hired a new county administrator. Same thing. It came down to ideology. I mean, we sat there and interviewed all these people. If someone would have walked in with a, you know, like I love Castro T-shirt on and started talking about, you know, they weren't going to get hired. It's like, and if all, if all the people were that way, we wouldn't have hired any of them. We would have kept the process going until you found somebody that was going to do effectively what a board, an elected board wants. So I, I it's- Well, because I think it's important to understand that there's not just, it's not one attorney who does everything. They have an entire staff and yeah, council. Yeah, it's like 12 people. So this is just who they're hiring to oversee all of that. So cases will still keep going and movement will keep happening cases will keep going on and, and, and most the of what they out. do not all but most of what they do is very nonpartisan anyway um in a perfect world it would all be nonpartisan. um but again slip and fall is not a republican democrat thing um whether or not there was an issue with employees in theory is not a republican or democrat thing um land use is not a republican or democrat thing i mean you can go into private property right kind of thing straight but for the most part where you're going to see it is when people ask, hey, can you write resolutions about things or can you write an ordinance about this or sanctuary that, then you start getting into that. Whether or not that should fall within the local government anyway is a whole other can of worms but in discussion, but for now it has. And you need an attorney who, if they want to keep their job and we don't have to start a search over again, you don't want an attorney saying, I'm not writing that. Like, that's right now, i got to hire somebody new. But most law is interpretive, right? And a lot of what we have to do. They're not judges, they're attorneys. What's that? 
They're not judges, they're attorneys. But the way that they present the case, the way that they present their, their position either for or against to mitigate the risk or, or accept the risk has to do with a lot of Burke Harris issues, right? Just on the development side. Right, and a lot of the conflict in the county right now in the view of the constituents has to do with the developers. Yeah, so, but okay, I hear what you're saying. Here's the thing. Their job is to fight for whatever we say, whether they agree with it or not. It's like being a defense attorney. Okay. Like, it doesn't matter if you did it, it's a matter if they can prove you did it. Like, if we vote no on a development, like for instance, Tara came, well, I'll use Tara because it, it's no longer in the courts. A previous board voted no to allow a developer to use the land in front of Tara, and you know well, yeah. um, to build commercial. They sued the county for Bert Harris, saying that we took away their development rights and, and caused you know, an equitable loss for their investment. It didn't matter if, if Bill Clay, or at that time, Mickey Palmer, thought they had a right to build on it or not. Their job was to fight and whatever the board said. The board said, we don't want the building on it. They had to defend that, whether they liked it or not. That was a political thing. That's just their job. But they don't advise And we you. lost. But they don't advise you ahead of time, since you're not the legal expert? We have briefings, um, but some there's stuff. First off, well, we're not the attorneys. They're not the board that's elected to make decisions. There's, there's gray areas in a lot of development. Some of it's very straightforward, but a lot of it is not. It's subjective in nature, so there is no right or wrong answer. I mean, the, the, the right answer as an attorney, if his whole job is to minimize risk to taxpayers, would be just literally approve everything. If it gets this far, if it's gotten through our pre-apps, and it's gotten through our planning, and it's gotten through our planning commission, and it's gotten you, just approve it. That's literally the easiest, cheapest, safest way of doing it because you'll never get sued by Bert Harris. And the state legislature has made it so insanely cost prohibitive and difficult for the public to fight us on it. That that's, by an attorney standpoint, that's the easiest way of minimizing risk. Is that the right answer? 100% not. But that's what an attorney would do if he's trying to tell you how to lessen your risk. Because now the state made it where if you as the citizens go and fight me because I approved Tara, now if you lose, and there's a good chance you will because they got insane amounts of money and it's stable of attorneys and you got Dan Lobeck, then you, then you have to pay their legal fees if and when you lose. There are times where people are successful, but it's few and far between. So when you say that the developers can come at you because you, this is something I've been wondering over years, because you guys deny, a, say you want to deny a project, okay? And you even said this, because I shared the video, on one of the things about, and we have this out in Mayaka really, really bad, where they go, they buy the property, and then bulldoze it or light it on fire. We just had another wildfire out there controlled burn um, and then bulldoze it and then ask for rezoning that's the thing that's the biggest yes and okay. if if I don't know if I'm saying that's right but so okay you don't want to get sued by the developer and, and now this and that which we know a lot of them are backed by the developers but if you stop the rezoning quit rezoning because they bought it as agriculture okay it's supposed to so that's the one thing i haven't been able to understand for years okay here's the thing in 1989 we created a map and the map had future zoning it, it was it was a forward thinking idea of what manatee county is looking at or redoing it right now you couldn't back in the day like ranch didn't exist right and i mean country club was starting next get going. I mean, it was created, but it wasn't like it is now. You couldn't go out and rezone all that land R3 and U3 then because it's cost prohibitive. I mean, the tax base would go through the roof because of the, the zoning and the value of that land. So what they said was, we'll keep it as ag as long as you want. We're not going to force you to rezone. But here's a map and it basically says you have a reasonable expectation, not a guarantee, but a reasonable expectation that when you want to rezone it up to this level, we're going to allow you to do so. You still have to come from the board. There is, we don't know what it's gonna look like at the end of the day, if we, we end up building a bunch of heavy industrial around there or something, maybe your R3 goes away, but 
you have a reasonable expectation that your future zoning right is going to be R3 for that land. So we can't just, I know people all want to act like this, this is like snap your finger moratorium on rezoning and saying, oh, you were ag, so that means you stay ag forever. But they have got a map that said they have a reasonable expectation when they acquired that property, a reasonable expectation of equitable return based upon the right to build three houses per acre on there. Yes, they had to make sure it met setbacks and other restrictions and wetlands and so on. But otherwise, we have a hard time legally prohibiting somebody from doing that if it falls within that map. What you're seeing now is people saying, okay, I know it said R3, but since then all this other stuff has happened. So realistic, give me R9. That's a different story. Now you can argue whether or not the board until in infrastructure catch up should be up zoning things above and beyond that map. But a flat out, you're not rezoning anything. I will literally never agree to that. That's, that's a terrible economic policy that just leads to a supply demand imbalance that causes more trouble down the road than it's get tired of hearing supply and demand. But it's true. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you want, you want to see an example? The, the, the geniuses in Minneapolis decided, hey, we're going to pass rent control. That was in 2020. Literally pass rent control restricting all rent increases to like 3%, including future development, then existing development. The next day, the day after the election, 70% of the permits for multifamily got pulled. All the developers just said, forget, I'm leaving, and went next door. Like, you don't think that's affecting the rent long term in that town because of And I, I use it as an example because it's, it's home. We had a moratorium. I've said this a, a million times. From basically 2008 through 2012, nobody built anything. I remember the moratorium. But it wasn't a real moratorium. It was no bank gave you money to build anything. So nobody built houses, nobody built apartments, nobody built anything around here. Because for four to five years in these epicenters like Lehigh Acres down in, down in Fort Myers and up here in Bradenton and Sarasota and all these like houses, nobody built anything. We're still digging ourselves out of a hole for that. I mean, you go, we, everyone wants to talk about affordable housing. There's a reason why we're so short on affordable housing is because all that stuff that could have been built 20 years ago and now would be a little bit more affordable in class B, B minus, C plus type property just due to you know, age and, and obsolescence wasn't built. Well, for instance, like KVO likes to say that people want to move here, so we need to, and a couple others have said it, so we need to provide them housing. No, we don't. Other counties and other cities and other states have said no. Mm -hmm. You know, no, we're not going to make it convenient for you to move here, it comes to a point where it's gotta be, we're full. You know, look at the waterways and stuff like that. So that, I guess that's what I don't understand. Why are we catering to the, and then when they I, get I, here. I think the fallacy in your argument is you're using pronouns that don't make sense. Like, we're not doing anything. I represent the government in the capacity of policy making. I am not a developer. I am not providing a single house for a single person moving to Manatee County. I am following the law as dictated to me based on my position as an elected official, which is to look at our land development code, look at our comp plan, look at our future zoning rights. And if a private individual and private company wants to build based upon rights that they legally have, I cannot preclude them from doing so. I am not providing anything. I'm not out there by building. Well, I'm things. not saying you, I'm just saying that was their words. I, I get you no, know, I get you as their Mark, words, but but the Mark. point is people are people act like we somehow control the private sector, like we hold something over and we don't. Like I said, there are things like I've tried to pull 2.1.2.8 that gave excess land above and beyond. I, it's a shame, not a shame, because the city of Bradenton at least is doing their part, but development all this growth should be more towards the city centers, and they're not because nobody's ever built there because the zoning didn't work, and now, unfortunately, it, they didn't do a good job of infrastructure downtown. Um, so you don't have right-of-way access to widen roads and fixed traffic. It's all well and good putting an extra 2,000 homes downtown Bradenton or units down there because then they can walk to work, walk to the grocery store and everything. But I don't know how you're gonna get cars in and out of there now because you built a lockup self-storage facility with zero setback. You built the Aria apartments with zero setback. You can't widen the roads. I, so that, that's, that's a hurdle we have to figure out. The only real way of doing it is a big flyover on the new bridge that gets everyone to bypass downtown entirely 
Because right now the problem is we have people coming from Ruskin and South Pinellas that are cutting straight through our downtown, clogging up our traffic, but their intention is to get to Sarasota. They just don't want to go on 75 because there's an accident and they're tying up our downtown with no intention of needing to be downtown. I'd much rather get them over downtown. Oh yeah, we get it down here. Yeah. Are you done? Yeah, I'm sorry. Oh, no, 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 that's okay. Um, question on the the um, increase in the impact fees, the uh -huh. recent one, the 12 and a half percent over four years. Correct. Is that- 20, 12 and a half percent per year, per four year. or four years. Not 12 and a half percent <clears throat> over four years. No. For four years, which is 60, it's compounded, yeah. that 60% increase. Is that? Um, well, it's not compounding. Okay. It's not, it's, it's simple, it's simple increases. It's 12 and a half percent per year going up to the, the total. And because you're using a, a fixed amount. So if it's $10,000 of impact fee, it would go to 12, it would go to, it, 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 it's, it, it's not compounding because it's not 12% on the previous 12%. Okay. It's 12 and a half, 12 and a half, 12 and a half to a collective 50%. Um, is that on every service on, you know, there are different impact fees for different, different, uh, services. Correct. So is that across the board on every one of them? Or is are you saying services based on product type? Are you saying services based on library versus public safety versus transportation? Road, roads, roads. Yeah, stores. it's technically across everything, but the okay. reality is the transportation component of the impact fees are something like 86% of it. So okay. the, the rest of it is so almost meaningless. I know some developers have pushed back on having a library component to it. Mm -hmm. The library component is like 70 bucks a house or something like that. Is it? I mean, okay, I guess. Um, you can put a slightly nicer doorknob on the front door. <laughs> it's not moving a needle. The, the transportation, I mean, for all intents and purposes, the impact fees are transportation fees. Nobody even realizes that there's public safety to help build EMS stations right. or, um, you know, libraries or parks, because there's such nominal little amounts in there. I was just curious. Yes, it, it's just a straight across. Okay, thank you. So what, what are we basing that 12% off of the the recent study, <gasps> plus plus you. No. the recent study effectively is has almost well, not almost. The recent study has absolutely no bearing whatsoever on the future impact fees. Okay, so Here, here's here's why the impact fees again. I'll use round numbers. Say the impact fee today is ten thousand dollars. That's based upon ninety percent of two thousand fifteen study, which was based on 2013-14. Ten thousand dollars. Okay, we're going to increase. All we can do is increase that $10,000 by 50% spread over four years to get there. So we can take that 10,000 to 15. At this point now, because we didn't go for the full study amount, all that study is doing is giving us legal cover to say, hey, once we get to 15 grand, we're in good shape because it's supposed to be 25,000 and this is less than that. That's the only reason that study exists now because we can't get all the way to that study based upon this motion. We can only get to 50% of the 2015, which has absolutely no effect on the new study. That new study has no impact on our impact fees, other than if that 50% increase, like say the new study would have said impact fees should be $13,000. Then if we said, hey, it is 10, we're gonna increase 50% to 15, then that study would have kicked in because it would have capped us at the 13, because we can't exceed that study. But because that study was so far in excess of the 50%, it doesn't have any effect on the calculation. All right, so previous, before the escalation, we were getting 40 cents on the dollar. Right. What are we getting now, after four years? 60%. After four years? Yes. Okay. And where is it, what is it? Well, to be fair, it's 60 cents on the dollar based on the 2023 study, based on 2022 data. So it's 60 cents on the dollar, but you're not getting there for four years. By the time four years comes, that study would have increased itself based on inflation. So it'll no longer be 60 cents on the dollar four years from now because the cost will continuously be going up, but our, our impact fees won't be going up. We're still taking the 50% on the 2015 number. So right now, if the study says it should be 25,000, we're getting from 10 to 15, which would be 60 cents. But in that four years, this 25 would probably go to like 27 or 28 it would be still chasing forward because inflation would continue driving those up, but the, the inflate, we're not tying our increase in impact fees to CPI. So we're still capping. So it's 60 cents on the dollar, but it's 60 cents on the dollar based on today's cost. Whereas those costs are gonna continue going up 
infl with inflationary pressure, whereas our impact fee increases will not. So the basis was based on, let's say, 3.5% interest rate, and now we're at seven. And because the county pays, the county pays ahead of recouping the, the associated cost, right? Is that additional 3.5%, let's say, in the rate of issuing of new debt, is that taken into account? You're kind of losing me out here. Okay, so you are. So we pay. We pay the cost. The impact fees are a fixed amount. It doesn't matter. Impact fees are not adjusted based upon our, whether or not we leverage them or not, whether or not we float bonds or not, whether costs change or not. Impact fees are a fixed, finite amount of dollar. How we spend those and the timing of spending those is at our sole discretion, and at no point in time does it have any effect on the developers paying the fees. So if we choose to collect impact fees year after year and just put them in a pile, which we used to do, and not leverage them at all and not pay debt service, then we go out and spend them. We'll collect the same amount of fees. Then if we say, hey, let's bond $400 million over the past 24 months, which we have, and pay debt service on it, call it three and a half percent, which then we have to cover that debt service. We can either cover that through impact fees if it's going to a specific use or through general fund. Right. But it's still the same impact fee. We don't we don't charge a surcharge to the developer because we chose to float bonds on their impact. I understand it's a fixed fee, but what I'm getting at is when I'm trying to figure out how many cents we're getting on the dollar, now we're getting 40, you're saying it's gonna go up to 60. The cost of money uh, impacts uh -huh. How much you know? So that sixty cents on a dollar could actually be fifty-five if the interest. Oh yeah, that's rate. what I just said. Did yeah. you, did you see my move? Said, yeah. Yeah. I, I even did a little dance over here. Can yeah. I, wait. Can I get clarification for a second? The impact fee itself is based on what? The cost to build a home, or what is that? How? It's based on literally thousands of numbers. I was going to say it's a huge. Yeah. Have you read this thing? It's it's hundreds of pages. Uh, we have consultants. This is all they do. Um, I have to study it because I haven't yes. chance to read it yet. Well, that's what you Your eyes will process <laughs> it. No, it, it's a lot. Like, like, they, they go down to this is, it, you know, every house has 2.138 people that have 1.42 cars. Okay. And, and this is the average driving and blah, blah, blah. This is how many that, miles, like how much mileage you need, lanes you need. I mean, but they it's, based that on 2015. No, our new study is based on most recent data, which would have been collected in 2000. 22, presumably. Right, but we're not using that based on what? We are, we're using, again, we're not using anything. Uh, we're, like, we're not even really using 2015 because the 50% increase isn't even 50% increase on 100% of 2015. It's 50% increase on whatever our fees are today, which is only 90% of 2015. So it's not even a 50% bump on 15 data. It's, it's a 50% bump on 90% of 15. Um, we're, like I said, we're using this study to the extent it confirms that our new fees are below what the study said. That's the extent of it. And that's the state of Florida one. That, in 2021, the state of Florida passed a bill because the state of Florida hates local government and doesn't want us to have any say in how we do anything and decided we can't determine what's best because unlike conservative views of free market where I could say, this is what I need for impact fees, because these are the roads I need, and these are the parks I need, these are the libraries I need. This is what I'm charging you, and if you don't like it, go build in Sarasota, sure. or go build in DeSoto, and there'll be counties that say, I want tax base, I'll lower my impact fees inst instead of building roads. Come here. That's how free market works. You either build or you don't, and I charge with, it's like I've used the analogy with PGT windows. At no point in time does anyone run down a PGT and, and, and scream and yell about price control saying, I can't afford your windows, you need to stop charging more for windows. No, I'm charging what I want to charge. And if you don't want my windows, don't buy my windows. That's your call. I don't understand why government has become the only part of this conservative view that, that has to have price control. So the developers don't like the impact fee, that means maybe they will go away, most of them? <laughs> Is no, that no? Because we, we're not increasing. No, ours enough. are low no. compared to everybody else around that are at one hundred percent. Right. No, our, no, ours are very high. On an absolute basis, our impact fees are very high. Yes, our, our impact fees are higher than most. We're also way behind in infrastructure, and we haven't collected enough for a long enough period of time where we have more in infrastructure we can pay for with impact fees. But if you look at some other places, I mean, 
at, at a minimum, we're on par um, comparatively to a lot of other places like Sarasota or MPPs on an absolute basis. Right? So the fact that it didn't go from 90% to 100%, was that a, just a mistake or is the state law change where you can't go from 90 The board as well, the board decision was before I ever got there. Um, no, I know that. In November, the newest. in November, the discussion was to move it from 90 to 100. I'm going to get you one second. Um, my concern, and it's what I had the attorney look into, is part of that bill in 2021 said that municipalities cannot increase their impact fees more than once every four years. Okay. So I said, Bill, you better look into this. If we go from 90% to 100%, does that qualify as our only increase we're permitted for a span of four years? Are we going to stick ourselves with this insanely low fee for almost half a decade if we take this dime here? And he came back and said he doesn't have any level of certainty that we would not be stuck with that. Okay, that's so what that's, that's what changed all. That's why you did So we couldn't go from ninety to one hundred first, and then the, the fifty okay, percent. We would risk going from ninety to one hundred, and then be stuck then be there. Stuck. Okay, yes. That was yes. yes, sir. Cruise. Thank you for coming all the way across the river. Did you kayak here? I didn't want to. That's why I was late. I waited until some of the traffic broke down. Um, it was a red letter day for me. The clerk published the comprehensive annual financial report. And you stay this up all night reading. I was just lapping that up. For the for those of you that don't know what that is, that's the income statement from Manatee County for fiscal 2023, which is ending September 23. Anybody want to guess what the surplus was for 2023 in Manatee County? Any guesses? Anybody that really knows? Anybody cares? Commissioner, do you know? Uh, I'd say $900 million. <laughs> You're uh, slightly over. Uh, the surplus was $294 million. Revenues, less expense. Okay. All the money coming in, all the money going out is $294 million. That's the all time record in Manatee County for a surplus. Um, there was a capital spend, which was also at an all time high of $280 million. So despite the capital spend going up by 50% for fiscal 23, the surplus still maintained at a very high level. The surplus well, they, don't forget a lot of that capital spend went because we got a lot of money from the state and from the federal government. Those dollars went towards Marcus and Wall and elsewhere. We also floated an additional bond issuance of $170 million, plus we were still spending the money from the $250 million bond issuance to get all the right-of-ways done and the pre-work done on Upper Manatee and 75th and Lorraine and elsewhere. So there was a big heavy capital expense increase, but that wasn't going to affect the surplus because it was coming from other buckets of money. Yes. Um, and actually, the capital grants and contributions fell by $37 million, uh, last year. So, um, so my question was really twofold. <sighs> Given this huge surplus, does it make sense to talk about a millage cut in this fiscal year? And a substantial millage cut, let's say a 0.5, that's question one. Question two is, um, the cash pile right now is over a billion dollars, um, which is roughly what your expenditures were in 2023. Can we take the average surplus of the last five years, and let's call it 200 million? We've had a roughly $200 million average surplus over the last five years. Mm -hmm. And talk about returning some of that money, let's say 25% of the 200 million would be a $50 million tax credit against 24 taxes as a way to reduce the cash pile, which is far in excess of Florida statute, which says you can only hold cash reserves equal to 30% of your projected budget for that particular fiscal year. So 30% of it, let's say your spend is a billion dollars. So 30% of that is 300 billion. Yeah. Right? And that's what the statute the on the state of Florida and puts says. And I can give you the chapter and verse on that. What? So we're 700 million over statute. So wouldn't we're, it make- we're, we're what now? I'm we're 700 million over statute. Our cash pile is a billion dollars if you take out all the debt. Our actual cash pile is 1.7, but let's take out 700 million because that's debt cash. So debt, uh, cash, unencumbered cash 
is a billion dollars. That is $700 million over what Florida statute is allowing you to hold. And it's been that way for a number of years. We've been way over Florida statute. So question B is let's take the surplus, average surplus of the last five years has been about $200 million. Let's take 25% of that, $50 million, and apply it as a tax credit for fiscal 24. So that's that's my, as you know, my, my uh, well be in my head, a 0.5 millage cut in a 25% um, of the average surplus as a tax credit, $50 million against property taxes collected last year, 330 million. So it would be a substantial tax credit against the upcoming fiscal 24 property tax, which would offset the 50% increase I had in property home, homeowners property insurance this year. It's a way to mitigate some of those insurance costs that are, you know, hitting everybody in this room. Insurance is up 50%. Let's do uh, a tax credit of $50 million against fiscal 24 property taxes. But just for, I'll just get, for I'll get right on that. What no, I, I, haven't, I haven't seen this study, so I'm not going well, to. I'm going mean, to say I'm not going to opine on it. I can pander to you and say, yeah. I mean, what's, I, I'm the only person on this entire board who's made a motion to cut millage three times over the span of two years. Uh, and I've cut it both times. And so I'm not adverse to cutting millage. I always like to cut millage. I, I don't like taxes any more than you do, but I can't comment on whether or not 0.5 mil cuts and tax credits make a whole lot of sense. I don't know because I haven't seen that. I sit with finance every year. It used to be with Jan Brewer, now with Sheila, and I go through everything in that budget before our budget season. And I ask them, where's our cushions? Where's our surplus? How, you know, what can we cut? What's what's reasonable? And I sit with them and go through it. And then I'll go over and I'll talk with the administrator. And I talk with some of the directors if more money's going there. I've sat and talked with Angel and her team. I've sat and talked with Wells and his team. I do a deep dive on this budget every year. And I was able to cut 0.2 one year and 0.3 another year through that. And I tried to cut even more one of the years, but people on the board flat out said, I'm comfortable with this level, but I'm not comfortable with any more than that. And a year when I tried to cut even more than that. So I, I would just I'm, not, I'm not against you on this, but I'm also not going to cut things just to cut things. I mean, I'm not well, you, running around just trying to brag I'm cutting taxes. I want to make sure that we're yeah. doing what we're doing. And I get it. I know your numbers. I've seen it a million times. I've seen um, I, I just say I, I know where, where you see the surpluses, and you know I need to look at the numbers myself. I don't have those numbers. I want to just give you one more number, Commissioner. Sure. Uh, the surplus was two hundred ninety-four million fiscal twenty-three. Okay. The taxes collected were three hundred forty million. So you can make this statement, I think, fairly that eighty-six point three percent of the of the taxes collected in Manatee County last year were not spent. They ended up in the surplus of $294 million. 86% of, you could have run the county. I get you, you're kind of and only that collected weird vacuum. Like 14% of the actual property taxes that were collected and you would have balanced your books. Yeah. You know, revenue is less expensive. I disagree with your analysis. I know where you're getting there. You're, you're, you're treating money like it's fungible, but it's not always as fungible as you make it seem. Look, I'm not a big fan. I hate, I just had this conversation with, with Jess. I hate property tax. There's a, there's an OPACA study that, that they ordered to get rid of property taxes entirely in the state of Florida and switch entirely to a consumption tax. I love that study. I'm waiting to see that study. It's supposed to come out next year. Well, places Harold. in Michigan have done that because I hate the fact that anybody can use their harder money to buy their own parcel of land and then build their own house on it. And then the government charges you rent for the right to use your you own really land your to house. build your you own house. Your house. And then you get these retirees that pay off their mortgage. And they're like, I paid my mortgage. I'm free and clear. I'm on a fixed income. And I go, oh, wait, wait. Someone else built nicer houses down the road. Therefore, your property value went up. Now I'm going to charge yes. you more rent for your land with your house. I hate that. So I am 100% on your side. I hope that study comes out successful. And I hope people take a serious look at it. I'd much rather have a consumption level tax and just get rid of property tax altogether. I think they're ridiculous that government's charging you to use your own stuff Sorry. and that the amount I charge you has nothing to do with your stuff. In fact, your house probably is depreciating in value over time, but new people are building newer stuff and that's increasing your rent. I think it's ridiculous. Just, you know, 
just from a, analyze this if you're a politician. And you can come to the voters in November and say, hey, you know what? I cut the millage tax this year in 2024. I'm the guy that led the charge to cut your property tax. So vote for me. Yeah. But Doesn't that make sense? No. It it, it, it sure makes sense for some people. I but cut your property tax. I, I get it, but by that logic, I mean that's that's a that's a one time cut that I'm not that I can campaign on without dealing with the ramifications of it that aren't gonna be witnessed for at least one more year. Like by that logic, I might as well cut your taxes in half and then really go campaigning and get reelected and then have to deal with figuring out how to work with half the taxes the next year. I mean, wh where's the end of that? What am I gonna start doing? Like landscaping all of your medias? Well, if you don't get reelected, you're not gonna be able to do anything. So I think it's a good campaign point. And if I was you, that's I, I, what I, I would say. I also, think, I, I also think I've diligently reviewed the budget. I have lowered taxes twice. I think I've been a good steward of tax dollars yeah. here. George, I'm voting for you. I appreciate it. And you know I made a contribution. I so I'm supporting you 100%. Hey, Mike. But I want you to I need get after it. It's an election year. Cut the millage. Get oh, a yeah. property like tax I said, credit. I have no problem. <coughs> I just want to see the finish. I just don't want to promise you anything sitting here until I can see the study and I can sit with the finance. I've tried to cut the millage every year. I'm not a first of it. Mike, the 294 that you said are a surplus, do you mean that, that has, it's not earmarked for anything, it's just sitting there as cash? It's a surplus, it's revenues collected in fiscal 23, mm -hmm. less expenses. Okay. 294 so million, just, which is 86% of the property taxes collected. Right, I understand. Which means you could have run this county by collecting only 14% of the $330 million in property tax. And it would have made a big difference to people that are trying to pay their car insurance and their homeowner's insurance and, in this and state like I said, and I will, in this county. Like I said, I will look at it, however, every year for the past three years, I've been told there's a $200 million surplus and that we don't need to charge taxes, yet nobody has shown me the $600 million of cumulative surplus that's just fell out of pile. Every year it seems like it's the same $200 million for some reason, so I, I need to look change. at that and figure out where this money's eventually getting spent, because some, at some point this $200 million is getting spent, otherwise the new the next year $200 million will get thrown on top of that pile, and it'll be $400 million, but it's not. And if we have all that million, then why are we taking out bonds, bonded money and paying interest? Ask Scott hopes. Uh, it's a legitimate question. What do you, you, See if what Scott can use his one call. Bonds? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> completely unnecessary. Completely unnecessary. I get it. Like I said, are I, there, I, are I, there I, any states that don't charge property tax? I think Scott. There's parts of Michigan. I don't know if it's the whole state. I know at least parts of Michigan have done without it, or at least done case studies on it. The truth I know the state won't much look at doing it in Michigan. I don't know of any others. That study is in process now, or they, is they, this completed? this legislative session, they were running a bill to authorize OPAGA to do a study okay. that's supposed to come back at the beginning of 2025. So that would be a next session discussion. And OPAGA's here in Florida. Yeah, that's the that's the same group that looked at whether or not Town of Lombo Key should be just in Sarasota or Manatee. It's the same group looking at consolidating that properties out, uh, the, the towns and cities out on the island. The, the study um, is gonna be interesting, but remember that consumption will affect low income and right. medium income. It's regressive. Yes, so it's going to impact the collections because most people with a lot of cash are not spending that cash. Mm -hmm. They're buying assets like their homes and their boats and so forth. Um, the, the billion dollars that we have in our See, see what see what you did in pilot cash. It's actually one point seven. <laughs> <laughs> the, the one, one billion is not debt encumbered. That's that's just a bunch of surpluses that have piled up over the years. Actually, the last five years, uh, we've accumulated surpluses of about a billion dollars, and now that's showing up as cash on Manatee County's balance sheet. Now, does that does your report show you where that money is? Is it money? It's sitting in a money market fund, Megan, five percent. Okay. And it's money that's been extracted from Manatee County's economy and is no longer circulating within the economy because it's in a money market fund and, you know, so state of Florida short-term uh, government money market fund. So I know government and county is different than, <laughs> than corporation, but if you've got excess every year, that effectively is your, your net P&L that should go into your equity, which is what he's saying is that pile of cash. So every year, 
we have that, that's my point it's it, it doesn't cumulatively increase year by year so it's going something like i said i have to look at the report i don't have it it okay. just came out i, I don't want to sit here and speak to numbers about a, a report that i haven't read yet that's not doing me or you any good right i'm just guessing at this point is it on the website go to the clerk's website Mantee county clerk yep and just we're on the query you know section yeah just type in comprehensive annual financial report and just came out so you can be the second person in the whole county that reads it. awesome i'll be the third <laughs> i was the first i'm sure i'm sure you were you probably got a special i was jumping up and down at eight eight o'clock this morning and i said jordan's going to talk tonight i wonder if the clerks put out the camper game. and there it was uh, off the bank angel <laughs> Try to put it on. <laughs> She's early. She was. She got it out before March first, which is like an all-time record. I mean, I mean, you just think about, it. you know, Bank of America and you know United Healthcare and all these major Fortune 500 companies. They they get their year-end report out three weeks after the end of the year. It takes us five months, six months. Why, why does it take us so long for the clerk to produce this report? Because you make decisions on spending and you don't even know what happened in, in fiscal 23. You don't know. All you know is what happened in fiscal 22. You don't see the actual financials for 23 until today. And yet, you're being asked to make spending decisions without even knowing what the numbers are for the prior year. And it just... Uh, the fiscal management just, and it's a huge amount of money now, folks. Agreed. It's a billion dollar, you know, annual budget. It's big numbers. Are we still working on the comp plan? Yeah. Are we still working on it? Oh, yeah. Okay. Is there, is there like a target date for yep. when it's going to be? I have no idea. Okay. I asked and I was told it's being worked on. Now, will that, will that comp plan address the event debt? Exactly. The comp plan can address anything it wants to address. It's a, it's a broad, long, big. So the, the FDM is part of it. Okay. Um, so yes, in theory. That said, somebody could make a motion to do something with that without this entire rewrite. This is a broader, uh, full re -up, like update of the, the plan about incentives being offered and the future land use map and development code. There's a lot more to it. The FDAB is just one piece. Somebody could have made a motion a year ago, yesterday, or whatever they want to move that line in theory. There'd be other steps you to make a motion. I feel like it's already been moved, especially with some of the stuff. When I was driving out there the other day, I'm going back out this weekend, the stuff that I've seen in Salida Golf Club, everything out of their mouth was a lie. And, you know, they're bringing in dump trucks load it yeah. to, to, to be fair that, that has absolutely nothing to do with the FDAB. that had nothing to do with 2.1.2 but that was wholly separate the FDAB was supposedly no building pass no that's no, factually no. that's factually incorrect people want to say that but i drive down to Mayaka and lo and behold there's a house there like did, should i pull well, those there? like silver star uh, Dakin's there. No, you're allowed to build these to the FDAP. The, the, the concept that this is some sort of a barrier between development and raw land is it, just not true. You That land out there has rights to ag, and ag has rights to residential. The golf course you're referring to is building one house per five acres. They're clustered. They're clustered to prevent them from being built right next to a river and right on top of our wetlands, but they're building one house per five acres in accordance with the zoning they already had. They didn't need 2.1.2.8. They didn't need an FDAM. They didn't do anything more than the other way. Could. If we would have said no, they could have went and put one house per five acres dead smack on top of more environmentally sensitive land. What? And then in exchange, they wouldn't get a golf course? Like, that, that's the only difference. Uh, they weren't, it's not like they built a condo. They just didn't. I'm telling you, they're just I, I, I voted in favor. I there. voted in favor. I, I, I know. I, I hear people saying they, they brought a dump truck of dirt in. I mean, they're, they're building. They're, they're, there's going to be fill associated Tons with anything. Of dump trucks. At no point in time did they promise that they were going to do no fill. Like, you can't build without it. It's impossible. Everything would just sink. I know. I guess my gripe is when these developers come in and they're building on wetlands and they're building on. They're not on building on wetlands. 
They're not, yes, they are. They're not impacting wetlands. And then they bring in all the fill dirt, all this fill dirt, bulldoze all these trees down. They're getting ready to burn on Salida now. All of the trees that were supposed to be left for the buffer mm -hmm. are all gone, stripped. I sent you pictures. And they fill it them all in. So then everybody else, now that's a flood zone over there. I had to go out there with other people and help. And I, my daughter, her boyfriend, them out there recovering deceased horses and stuff from Hurricane and all this other stuff. Those places flooded. My boat was under 13 feet of water. I was there every single day. You know, I. But I'm telling you, when they come in and they bring all this filtered in that they swear they're not doing, which we have video proof of it all. I still don't recall them swearing they're not putting filter. And But all of that adds to more flooding. So, okay, Ian, there was 13 feet of, of flood waters. Well, to be What's fair, when, yeah, when Ian flooded, again, I was there from the minute the sun came up to the minute the sun went down for five days straight out there. That flooding was, was it was almost entirely a result of the rivers cresting, Correct. not because of fill on other on previously developed land but that was going to flood with or without it, because it was such messing. an insane amount of water coming down Peace River, Mayaka River, that they crested and flooded Crane Park and all these other places. There's no development around. I mean, you, we're acting. You're saying it flooded, but there's no development out there now. If it flooded without that development, it's just a flood-prone area. If you get but hit by if a they're hurricane. bringing in dirt and they're redredging and doing this and doing that and doing this and doing that, that is going to affect it again. I'm, okay. Worse, sure, right? Sure. Then there's a there's a theoretical chance it will negatively affect it to some extent, but that that goes for everything. You everyone everyone's been complaining all week about how bad the traffic was this week. What do you want me to do? Build more lanes to have less traffic? Guess what? By pure definition of putting more lanes out there and paving over green space, I am theoretically negatively impacting the flooding opportunity in those areas. Should I not build the roads? Anything I do that's gonna alter the environment, in theory, nature knew what it was doing when nature was nature. As soon as I build a house, a park, a pickleball court, a boat ramp, a street, a street lane, I'm going to negatively affect something. I have to weigh the, the pros and cons of what I negatively affect versus the positives of the community. That's what we do for a living. That, that's what I have to do. The dam road project is one that really messed up. I voted a lot of no residents. on that every single time it came in front of us. Like literally, I argued moving a utility line instead of the FDAB line just out of pure spite because I didn't like that project. So I, I don't disagree with you. But yeah. now it's done. Um, and then with the burn, something's got to be done with them being able to go through and light these. So-called controlled burns that get out of control and cause wildfires, like the M Road, for example. Eight to ten fire trucks, because they were doing a controlled burn, nobody stayed around to keep an eye on it or do anything. Eight to ten fire trucks go out there and put it because it got out of control. There was just another one recent, allegedly, you have to say. Well, you don't see the animals the next day. Certain people are out there on their four-wheelers looking and it sent me pictures of some of the carcasses and stuff, you know, and little teeny baby pigs trapped and running around and, you know, it, they're basically just slaughtering wildlife and acting like there's a certain person that works in the office over there. Well, actually a couple people that, or for these environmentalists that have flat out said they know that this eagle nest is being destroyed, this is being destroyed, that's being da da da, but they are not allowed, they can't say anything or do anything because it would be career suicide. So, whenever you sit there, now, it's gotten to the point now, we don't even want to tell people where these panthers are, where the eagles are, because there's been times where it's done we've showed and then somebody would go out there from their cute little organization or whatever that worked for them and literally shoot the eagle dispose of it there's stuff that they do under cover of dark but mostly the fires 
they are never handled accountable for those fires and the effect that it has on other people. Is there anything you can do about that or no? I mean, they're, they're allowed to control burns. I know what you're saying, they're not controlled, but you can't argue with me because I don't, I, I'm policy. And we are working on, I've directed staff to work on better ways of handling clear cutting, both pre and post. Mm -hmm. So I remember you saying um, that. They are working on it, not as quickly as I had hoped, and I don't think in the way I asked for it, but in theory, we're working on something um, that makes it a little bit better. As for the specifics on a lot of the, the clear cutting and the way they can and can't do it, honestly, and not to kick it down to other people, but a lot of that's state level, not us. Like, you're allowed to clear cut ag. They're very vague on clear cutting ag. You know, I had said, hey, we should make it, if you clear cut something based on an ag designation, you should be required to keep it ag for some window of time, like three years or five years. Like, go, you, you, better go, you better go plant some corn on there or mm -hmm. something. But what they do is they clear it first while it's ag, and then they come the next day and be like, oh, can I have this rezoned to R9? And oh, hey, look, it's clear. <laughs> yeah. So I don't think that was that the intent. I, I don't think that was the intent. Fire it, it's sort of like it's sort of like throwing three cows on a parcel of land and calling it an ag exemption. Um, but I also don't have a fundamental problem with that. And I've made this argument years ago that I think if you didn't do that, you'd end up with hyper growth above and beyond what we could even handle. Because if people started having to pay higher taxes on land, they may say the carry cost is too high, and then they just start building on it ahead of time, and you end up with excess excess supply. Um, and the, the taxes weren't anything when it was real ag, so it's not like I'm losing money on it. I'm just retaining the ag designation, the taxes I already have. Gotcha. Uh, but as, as for the clear cutting, as for that, we are working on some solutions to that. I've been looking at other counties. What do you, I, I don't know sign language. 311. Oh, yeah. And we do have the, the 311 app. In fact, we just relaunched it with some new features. So if you see birds going. I don't going, know about that. Yeah, if you download 311 app, we just relaunched it. Um, that goes for anything. If you have an issue with utilities, if you see a pothole, you can literally take a picture of a pothole, a little geo tag, like where you took a picture, you can submit that so that Public Works can come and fix the pothole. If you see things about dust and clear cutting and so forth, uh, you can report that to 311. I don't think it's a dedicated feature on 311 yet, but I heard they were trying to add something to it, like a I don't know what they're going to call it, destructive developmental practices or something, I don't know. But some way where you can record it so we know, because we see, otherwise we wait to see on Facebook and someone tags me right. on Facebook. And as you know, I don't, if someone tags me on my personal account, I don't respond um, because I can't turn my personal account into a county account because then that causes a lot of issues. Um, so I don't, but I see. I know, I just so, always forget all the time because I, I get all excited. Well, Larry, <laughs> and like I said, you and you're the only one who will listen. You literally tagged me the other day. I responded with, I can't respond to this tag. And then you tagged me again I to know. respond to the thing of me saying I wasn't going to respond. <laughs> I think they over <laughs> each other. I think I was typing at the same time. But, but it, it is something we're, we're, yeah. we're cognizant of. But For, fortunately, I do have other support on the board with that one because of Lake Flores, because of a few other areas that are falling more towards other commissioners' areas, because uh, they're hearing it as well. So there, there is support for trying to. I think it's just got, like, I don't recall getting calls from anyone and emails about clear cutting and, and this level of it my first two years. It seems like all the past 12 plus months, it's just now we get it all the time up at Mox Well, over at Bourneside, on 64, like last out week on El Conquist, and more. It's just gotten like, Almost out of hand. Yeah, of course. Now it's happening to the rich Wait, people. I'll, so, hold on. Oh my God. Um, I am I am trying to get information about the homeless committee. The homeless committee? Yeah, and it's being uh, coordinated by Maria Santos, who is a Manatee County employee. Oh. I have quest. I have texted her a number of times. When is the next homeless committee meeting? No response. Um, I was at Braden City Council this morning and one of the ladies, one of the council ladies uh, who sits on that committee, um, I, I said, I, I would just like to attend these meetings. And she said, well, there's, there's, uh, there's some kind of prohibition about the public being involved because they make public comments. And I said, well, this is the United States of America. 
and to uh, exclude the public because you don't want to listen to citizen comments is a violation of democratic principle, in my opinion. I would like to attend a meeting. I've done a lot of work on the homeless problem, including going up to Pinellas Hall and getting over to that jail in Pinellas County and all that stuff. Um, and I would like to contribute to that, uh, but I, I can't, I can't find out when the meetings are, or where they are, or what time is they are. I, I, I put a note. I'll find out for you. Um, is it a county board, or because you said some are from city council? Yeah, it there. sounds like it's an omnibus group that's being coordinated by Maria Santos, sure. who will not sure. tell anybody when the meeting is. The, uh, community permit program. Okay. Oh, yeah. So. Yeah, I'll look into it. I don't know about it. I mean, because I know like we had an informal uh, affordable housing board at one point. It was very informal. And it was like me, Shirley Bryant from Palmetto, and Charlie Kennedy when he was on the school board. And there, there was a cobble. It was just, it came organically out of a council of governments meeting. We all said, hey, let's get someone from each organization together to discuss it. I don't know the specifics. Like That's not one of our official advisory boards that fall under what, some level of sunshine that we have notice of yeah, so it's like you know i know it's meeting but i don't know anything about it um i mean i, I, I work there and kathleen I don't kramer it. about it who runs turning points actually last night to get invited and she said well i've heard that some people have canceled uh canceled their they're not going to attend so maria santos is supposed to call up people uh that are interested in attending and getting them at the meeting but and so i posed that question to Santos uh, on an email and you know no response so it's like oh. a buy-in by buy invitation only uh, yeah that's it not odd seems um, very that sounds strange like I said I'll I'll reach out and find out for you and I'll get you the information yeah and they usually respond at least half the time I ask can you uh, <laughs> can you just explain real briefly the the uh, hearing uh, subject on the phosphate moving it from the commission to administrator. What was the underlying purpose of that? Just streamlining something? It's, it's something that's been talked about for a couple of years. The thing is, we set policy. That's start to stop, that's our job, is setting policy. The minutia of the operation of the county falls outside of our traditional role when it comes to Florida statute or job description. So like I use the example of that, it's like our policy is whether or not to allow someone to build a hotel on a piece of land. If all of a sudden a, a, a huge anti-hotel contingent moves into Manatee County, and then they show up and they finish building the hotel, like, okay, now give me my CO so I can start putting guests in here. They don't have to come back in front of the board to get approval to be a hotel now. They just get the CO from staff. Otherwise, we'd have to bring them back in front of the board and then all these anti-hotel, like pro Airbnb people would all show up in the same color shirts and scream and yell saying, do not give them that CO. Like, I don't have the legal authority not to give the CO. So why am I even opening this up for discussion? It, it, it's not policy related. It's, it's, I have no legal authority to stop it. All I'm doing is giving you an opportunity to, to scream about something I can't do anything about. When it comes to phosphate, Everything from, if, if they want to buy new land, that has to come in front of us. If they want to rezone that land for mineral rights, it has to come in front of us. When they put together a master mining contract of what they can do with that land, it has to come to us. If they try to meaningfully modify any of their permits to be able to dig deeper, dig wider, or do something else, they have to come in front of us. If they want to change their reclamation laws, they have to come in front of us. All we said yesterday was they have to come to us continuously to reaffirm operating permits that as long as they go in accordance with a master mining plan, which we already approved, well, I've never approved this, never, none of these none of these big things ever come in front of the board, but any of us have been on. If they're gonna do it in accordance, we do not have any legal authority to prevent them from doing it. It's administrative. It's just basically reaffirming something that already exists. So the decision was, why are we putting this on the thing? Just like, why are we putting little things like we took off lighting the bridge? Like at one point, we had to put whether or not we were going to approve the Skyway Bridge to be lit up different colors on all of our agendas. <laughs> Seriously. Like every single time they wanted to light up a bridge, 
blue for for police or lighted up green for it was on our agenda every single time for like, like a solid year plus of my time on the board finally like this is dumb this is not policy and so we turned it over to the administrator this is similar to this is a a thing that, that really is not going to impact anybody's life as long as they do what they're supposed to do and they just do it just like we don't once we approve a, a subdivision they don't have to come back to us to get approval for the permits to build the houses on the subdivision we did the heavy lift of the policy of allowing the subdivision all the little things of connections of utilities to pulling permits to getting co's that's outside the scope of this board we don't give somebody the eighth time to come and, and argue against the development right, this, our, our jobs don't on your on your website your campaign website you had mentioned the phosphate video on my campaign website. Yeah. I, I had seen it on there and you just mentioned it's, it was on your facebook page it may have been on a facebook page from 2020 oh, yeah. right that's yeah. right i'm not your campaign your facebook okay okay so i watched it uh -huh. and you had made some comment about it's important to get perspective from all directions Correct. so you watched it and how much of that is fact or fiction i don't know i'm not a scientist but i i, I watched it and i watched it with just like I read things from both sides of the spectrum. I think too many people today are just live in an echo chamber because they want to be told what they already believe. That's why I read papers from both sides and watch TV from both sides and I answer emails and talk to people from both sides. So I hear a lot from Mosaic. I know Jackie and everyone over there. And so I wanted to see something from a different perspective. So I just encourage people, look at both sides, make your own opinion. I'm not going to tell you what opinion to have. But I think you owe it to yourself to look at both sides and then make your own educated opinion. Okay. okay. Just go to the people who did the movie and the other people that affected, they'll talk to you. They're on Facebook. Eric is one of them. I believe it's Eric. Eric Brown. He's local. Mm -hmm. Garrett Ramey. Garrett well, Mayaka Mouth Ramey. Well, what I'm, what I'm getting at is, with and you said something very interesting. You're not a scientist. So you looked at it, you absorbed it, you'll make your own decision mm -hmm. about it. But when we were talking about the buffer zones in, in the county, huh? and we marched in experts, I'm saying we, the county marched in experts, mm -hmm. these are the scientists and everything else, huh? and yet they voted to compress the buffer zones. But I voted against it. No, so. I know, I, under, I okay. understand that you did, and this is not directed towards you, but this is what- it Sounds like a strike. No, it is not. <laughs> The, the, the problem in the community is that, you know, we're going through, the community is going through the process. They're getting the experts, they're voicing their opinions, and yet the board, except for you, is not receptive to the facts and they're making decisions that are a problem. So, yeah. Because they're getting paid by the they're buying they're paid for it. For it. One boss. They're so, greedy, they're was, evil, was there a they're trash. <laughs> well, is there something more that, that we can do as... <laughs> so, I think your question is, so what do you think? True. <laughs> yeah, so what do you think? No, is there, I know what you think. I, I'm assuming what you think. But you know, what more can we do as voters and constituents right. rather than march experts in and you know present facts? Vote them out. Oh, there you go. George, I'll just march out one more uh, environmental issue. Uh, I've been picking up litter on a causeway for about eight years now. And in fact, I was just out there today. Um, and the horses are out there. The, the Suncoast Water Seekers does a weekly bacterial reading. Mm -hmm. And uh, for the week, weekend in February 19th, the bacterial count was 294. And anything above 70, is considered very dangerous. Wow. So there's all kinds of kids out there swimming in there, and there's windsurfers, and it, it's not just this one February 19th reading. There was a, an article in the Islander on January 24th that delineated some of the previous readings, and they were all like two, three hundred uh, concentrate cell concentrations of enterococci, which is another way of saying SHIT. So uh, there was actually one week there in December where the reading got over a thousand. And the danger, let me just finish my statement, thank you. Um, 70 
is danger, and 1,000 was one of the readings. Um, and there was also a, a little bit longer study from 22 and 23, which said that 40% uh, of the time, the water in North Palmasola Bay, where the horses romp, is unswimmable. It cannot, cannot be used over this 22, 23 time period. So I'm just pointing that out to you. I understand that the city of Bradenton has legal jurisdiction over this, at least at the present time. But that's another big, in my opinion, problem because when they were also looking at the readings on South Palmasola Bay during this Islander article, there were three readings on the north and there was three readings on the south but on the same days. There was absolutely no problem with the water on the south side. The south palm of Solo Bay water was all was clean, it was good, it was safe to go in. Whereas the water on the north palm of Solo Bay was extremely dangerous, unsafe, unsanitary. And yet there's no posting of any warnings because Florida Department of Health um, has decided that they're going to post a warning for South Palm of Solo Bay, as they have been doing for a number of years. So if there's a governmental body that's not protecting the citizens, which would be Florida Department of Health, should not City of Bradenton, which has legal jurisdiction, think about uh, starting uh, a weekly uh, notification problem to fill the hole that's not being you know, filled by I can think of at least Florida six people you should tell this to. Yeah. Huh? I mean, it, that's the city of Rainton. I don't interfere with me. No, I, I know, and I addressed them and this and morning. And once again, this is another report I have. I addressed them this morning on the topic, and when what I was done, you know, everybody was, nobody was, there was no response from any of the councilmen or the mayor. They're, can I tell you now? It's not the horses. The horses, okay. On the, if you're heading to Palmasola, to the left, where we call it Redneck Riviera, mm -hmm. where everyone goes Very swimming and their dogs and so on and so forth, this has been going on for years and years. There is a sewage pipe, and somewhere I have a picture of it that somebody had sent to me. There is a sewage pipe that has a, a leak, a hole, whatever. It is on a regular basis that sewage is coming out of that pipe. I do charters, okay? On the other side, well, they also have people that go behind. Horses, I've been riding horses my whole life. My daughter has equestrian centers. They don't always gonna poop in the water and they have people behind them cleaning it up. But the, the side where everybody goes swimming at, is constantly, constantly has sewage spill in it. The oyster beds and everything are all totally dead because there's so much bacteria in that water. Pipe in relation, and when you enter the causeway, or you get to the first bridge and you're on the north side, okay? Pretend you're heading to the to the island, yeah, and you're on Palmasola. Before you get to the bridge on the left is where everybody goes swimming. On the right is the horses. The horses are all being cleaned up. That 